Hello. In today's video, we're going to talk about how you can quantify bargaining power in a dyad of a supplier and a customer. And this video will go a little bit long because we're going to walk into some of the uh, analysis in some detail. So uh, bef uh, before you try to talk about what, why we might see bargaining power, you really need to establish whether bargaining power uh, uh, exists and how big it is and which company has it. Okay, so it's a little bit like our analysis of an industry. First, we establish how attractive the industry is, how big it is, growth, profitability, uh, volatility. We measure those things. And then we analyze why the industry is attractive or not using the five forces framework or some other me method of analyzing industry structure. Similarly, with bargaining power, we first want to establish which company has more bargaining power and, and how much more. We'll try to quantify it to, to the extent we can. And then we dig in to understanding what are the sources of that bargaining power. Why does Coca-Cola have more bargaining power relative to its fathers, for instance? So uh, bargaining can be, power can be manifest in several ways. Uh, so th the first and crude one is better performance, but of course their bargaining power isn't the only factor, so you want to dig in beyond that. Um, uh, pricing is the obvious way the companies exert bargaining power, so there's a constant uh, tug of war between supplier and customer uh, on pricing, and uh, the ways pricing are moving, it gives you interesting insights and important insights into bargaining power. Uh, there are a lot of non-priced ways that companies can exert their bar bargaining power, uh, payment terms, delaying payments, uh, or insisting on quicker payment from your suppliers is a common one, and, and we'll talk about some others. And so the, the big idea of this video is Establish bargaining power first, quantify it before you try to dig into why it might occur, and um, uh, and also don't rely on a single measure. It's useful to look at a couple of measures uh, to see how companies are manifesting uh, bargaining power. Try to quantify, estimate the relative importance, pull those together, and, and get the big picture of bargaining power. So let's talk through a couple of the uh, common ways that bargaining power is manifest. Uh, comparative performance is a quick and dirty way to estimate uh, which company has more bargaining power. Now, of course, uh, relative performance is influenced by factors beyond bargaining power. Um, but it, it's still, nevertheless, it's a, a useful measure. And, and it can, it's, a, a, it's super helpful as a quick, uh, you know, kind of quick and dirty first pass just to test your hypothesis. So in the auto industry, for instance, this, and this chart is from the Tesla case, you might have expected on the face of it, you know, there are only, let's say, 10 big OEMs in the world and hundreds of uh, component suppliers. You might have expected, just based on theory, uh, that the, um, the OEMs would earn higher uh, profits because they have more bargaining power. We don't see that. Actually, what we see empirically is that the return on invested capital for the top 100 suppliers is consistently and materially higher than it is for the OEMs. Uh, so it's a useful first cut. You wouldn't use it in isolation, but it's, um, it's helpful to take a look. Uh, a second thing, and, and this is probably the single most useful proxy or measure of bargaining power, is look at comparative pricing. Okay, uh, so again, customers are always trying to push their suppliers' prices down, and you know, suppliers are always trying to push the prices up. Uh, and there's uh, you know this constant constant battle going on. And looking at how relative prices change over time can give us some insight as to where the bargaining power really lies. Uh, so this uh, chart you may recall is from the uh, Cola Wars case, and what we see in this case is that uh, the, the, the price increases that the bottlers are getting at retail between 2008 and 2009 go up by less than 1%. But in that same year, uh, Coca-Cola is able to push up its concentrate price by nearly 4% uh, between uh, 08 and 09. And, and if we look at historical years, we see a similar pattern emerging where uh, you know, re retail prices are flat or even decreasing, and Coca-Cola and Pepsi are every year still managing to push forward price increases. So this is uh, you know, pretty compelling evidence that uh, the concentrate makers have more bottling power. Uh, sorry, more bargaining power, uh, Freudian slip. Um, and now let's try, you know, quick and dirty uh, back of the envelope analysis to quantify how much that bargaining power uh, as manifests through pricing power is worth to, let's say, Coca-Cola. So what we'll do is in this analysis, we'll say, okay, there's um, the difference in between the price increase at retail, which was a little bit under 1%, and the price increase for concentrate, which is almost 4% between 08 and 09, was 3.2%, okay? And so we can think of this as, uh, you know, in this kind of thought exercise, we can think of this as the benefit to Coca-Cola of the bargaining power. And it's equal to 3.2 times its total revenues. And we're making some simplifying assumptions. All its revenues are soda and blah, blah, blah. But this is just for illustrations, uh, illustrative purposes. So 
3.2% of their total revenues turns out to be $265 million in 2009. And now the great thing about price increases, of course, from, a, uh, from the perspective of the person who's, uh, who's pushing them forward, is there's no cost associated with that incremental revenue. It flows straight to the bottom line to profits. So that $265 uh, million in bargaining power at the revenue level is still $265 million when you get down to the EBIT level. And now uh, it accounts for about 10% of total EBIT, which is you know, a consequential portion of, uh, of uh, Coca-Cola's total EBIT in this year. So when uh, the data is available, of course, you want to go back and check uh, past years to confirm this is not a one-off event, as we just saw in the previous chart. Uh, and, uh, you know, we note that Coca-Cola is, is cons- and, and Pepsi are consistently raising the concentrate prices, even when retail fl- uh, prices are flat or declining. And so this isn't a, a, a one-off uh, pricing event. Okay. Uh, another uh, way a po- the more powerful party can exert its bargaining power is by requiring the less powerful party to bear costs. Okay, and again, we'll, we'll turn to an example from the Coca-Cola case. Um, so we see in this uh, in this example that the total system costs required to produce and sell a case of soda uh, uh, amount to nearly five dollars, and almost 90% of this uh, this cost is being borne by the bottlers, right? So in since, you know, Coca-Cola and Pepsi uh, need those costs, somebody has to pay those costs for Coca-Cola and Pepsi to make money. You know, in a world worth more even bargaining power, they might be bearing more of those costs in terms of direct marketing expense or SG&A, whatever it is. But again, this is evidence suggestive, uh, strongly suggestive that the concentrate makers have more bargaining power and able to push these costs onto the income statements of their suppliers. Uh, like price, payment terms is a common place where companies kind of play tug of war to exert bargaining power. So if I'm a, a customer, I want to um, pay you later. And if you're a supplier, you want me to pay you sooner. Uh, and we haggle back and forth on this. So um, it, it, the, this is real money. And I'll, I'll walk through this a little bit slowly, just make sure we're clear on this, although you cover a lot of this in accounting anyway uh, as the semester goes on. But so from a supplier's perspective, if their customers take longer to pay, it's like they, the suppliers, are giving an interest-free loan to their customers, but they're pay- they, the supplier, are paying the interest on that, and, and that's real money, okay? So um, the way you can think about this is, so let's say a, uh, a customer takes longer to pay their bills, then as a supplier, you can either think of this as, okay, if they would have paid sooner, I'd have had that cash and I'd have earned interest on that cash. That's real money. Or it takes them a long time to pay. I have to borrow money to cover that cash until they pay, and I pay interest on that money I borrow. So they're, they're conceptually indistinguishable, but that's the, the intuition as to why this is real money if customers take longer to, uh, to pay you, uh, or, or the other way around, they pay you sooner. So let's just walk through an example uh, uh, to, you know, kind of put some meat on the bones of this. So in this case, the um, told, um, so we've got this supplier, and their days receivable have increased from 30 days in 2015 to 45 days. And by the way, you'll, again, you'll cover this in accounting, but the way you calculate days receivable is just accounts receivable divided by revenues times 365, Okay. Uh, and so what this means in practice is that in 2015, on average, uh, customers were paying in 30 days. By 2019, it was taking them 45 days before they paid their bills. Okay. Uh, and then the other piece of information we need is what's the marginal cost of capital for the supplier? You know, how much does, does money cost them in terms of interest um, uh, to, uh, you know, to provide this, in, to provide this loan? And there are more sophisticated ways to do this, but a, a quick and dirty way is to just take the, um, uh, the net interest expense and divide it by the long-term debt. I mean, it's not perfect, but it gives you a, a decent estimate of, okay, this is the interest that the company is uh, paying. Okay, so it's, you know, it's not a terrible estimate. So then what we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, let's look. So now we're trying to quantify what is the cost of our customers taking 15 more days to pay than they used to. So we're not taking the, the f- total 45 days of payment. We're just saying the, the, the customers have stretched out their payment uh, period, and we're going to quantify how much that's costing us as a supplier. So we've got total revenues of $5.5 uh, billion, and we're assuming 100% of the revenues have receivables associated with them. There's no cash transactions. Then we say, okay, how much do we pay in interest per day? 
uh, and we just take the average interest and divide it by 365, pretty straightforward. And then we say, okay, now we've got on all of those revenues, we're, um, it's taking 15 more days before we get paid. And so we just multiply out total revenues times our daily interest rate times the number of days. And it turns out that's costing us $11 million uh, to carry those receivables to offer that interest rate loan to our uh, customers. And, you know, that it, it, depending on how... Uh, um, how long those days stretch out and, uh, and uh, you know, how big your receivables are, that this can be significant money. So payment terms really matter. Uh, one other thing on payment terms, by the way, if you see, just as a kind of sanity check, if you see accounts payable increasing for one party, you should see accounts receivable uh, moving the opposite direction for the other. So that's a, a little sanity check you can build in. Now, there are uh, myriad ways that companies can exert bargaining power, and you won't be able to identify and quantify all of them, but just some others for illustrative purposes. You know, customers can uh, demand exclusive products. Um, you know, uh, a, a supplier like Coca-Cola can pay for a portion of a bottler's advertising. Uh, Walmart can demand its suppliers invest to integrate into Walmart's IT system and others. So there are, there are different ways, and, and you won't Again, you won't be able to identify all of them. You won't be able to quantify all of them. But it is helpful to look at comparative performance pretty much always. Uh, you want to look at pricing. You want to look at payment terms. And then for the other ones, you want to look for the ones that are most salient for that company or that diet or that industry. Uh, and then what you do is, you know, again, back of the envelope, super simple analysis. Try to quantify what's the magnitude of this bargaining power. Uh, add the pieces together and see where uh, does it look like there's more bargaining power when you net things out. Having done that, then you can turn your attention to understanding what are the sources of bargaining power.